sponsored by the Associated Student Speakers Program. Directly following today's talk, we'll move up to the Women's Lounge for a question and answer period, which I think ought to be very interesting. Today's speaker, our guest to UCLA, has been in broadcasting for the last lot of years. He's been the director of KABC News since 1962. He resigned early in January to uh, run for the office of mayor. In my opinion, he's the most interesting candidate. He is not accepting campaign contributions, and he is just basically quit his job so that he wouldn't have an unfair advantage. And he is basically just going around and talking to people and trying to tell them his views and convince them over to his side. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Mr. Baxter Ward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marks. I didn't quit my job because I didn't want to have an unfair advantage. I would have been delighted to have had an unfair advantage. But the FCC requires that if you are in broadcasting and you announce your candidacy, from that date on, every appearance you make is subject to the claim of equal time by all of your opponents. And with 22 people in the race, the station would have had no programs at all, uh, <coughs> no violence, it would have been a tragic thing. There are many things that prompt a person to, uh, to do a thing like this, and I know in the news, I saw a great many items over the years that distressed me a great deal, and they're past and current. There was a case, uh, and involved in all this too, is our relationship with uh, not only city departments, but also the courts. And I think that somehow there must be an influence from City Hall that might somehow get to the courts. A few months ago, there was a case out in, uh, along the coast. A young man had borrowed somebody's motorcycle. It was a brand new motorcycle, just a couple of days old, and he, a good friend owned it. And the boy who did the borrowing had with him a girlfriend, a young girl in her late teens. And uh, they decided they'd take a spin on up Washington Boulevard. And their friend said, okay, take the bike and be careful. And they did. It was just dark, it just descended, and they were going on up Washington Boulevard. And all of a sudden, they were hit head-on by a car that was in their lane, coming the wrong way, with no lights on. They didn't see it, they had no chance in the world to know it was there. Hit them head-on, and both the young boy and the girl were killed instantly. And that was that. Well, in a few minutes, the police were called, and they came out to the scene, and they found the driver of the car, a young woman, still in the machine. She just sat there behind the wheel. And she wasn't speechless, but she was just numb and dumb. And they examined her briefly, and they decided, well, she wasn't drunk. She had not been drinking. And they made a little notation about drugs, but they never followed this up. They never did find out if she were under the influence of drugs at the time of the crash. Well, that was that. The ambulance was called, and the two bodies were taken away to the morgue. And that was the end of that part of the case. Now, the law takes over here. The young woman hired a lawyer for herself, and she had a preliminary hearing. And then the case was assigned to a superior court. Now, interestingly, her case finally was submitted on the basis of her transcript, of her preliminary hearing. And the reason we became interested in this is because it was heard, finally, before a judge in Culver City who some years ago had a son who was involved in a hit-run case on the Pasadena freeway. And the son killed the occupant of the other car, then sped from the scene. And there were two cases in which this boy was involved. And finally, justice prevailed the second time around. And we wondered on learning that this case was to be assigned to that judge, whether the judge really should be handling hit-run cases at all, or manslaughter cases of this type involving traffic. But he did. He heard the case. And we were dumbfounded to learn that a deal had been made between the lawyer for the young woman driver and the DA's office. Now, there were two persons who were killed. That's two counts of felony manslaughter. But one count was dropped. So the only thing that she was processed on was one charge of felony manslaughter. It was as if the girl on the back of the bike had fallen off some blocks earlier and hit her head on the pavement and died. She wasn't accounted for in the charge against this driver. All right, the judge accepted that. He didn't have to. He could have said to the DA's man right there, all right, let's find out what the whole case is about and bring this back in properly. He didn't. He accepted this reduction of intent, and that was all. And he studied the matter and he said, all right, young lady, you've done a bad thing, and therefore... All he did was give her probation. She didn't spend one moment in jail for taking those two lives, and finally that one life that the DA resolved. Besides that, there was a term attached to the probation. She was not to drive her automobile during certain hours of the night, and the time she was not to drive began at 1.30 in the morning and lasted until 6. <laughs> this kind of thing is absolutely shocking, but it goes on day in and day out in our courts, and it's an outrage. There's just, just no limit to it. There was an interesting case about a year ago along the coast involving a murder, 
and murdered was a young man who was the husband of a young woman. And the woman's parents were very concerned about her relationship with her husband. He was a well-to-do husband. He had done successfully, been very successful. He had about a $75,000 or $80,000 home in Palos Verdes. And to this home, the parents, his in-laws, came frequently. They quarreled. They knew that their daughter had a drinking problem, and they felt that the young man, the husband, wasn't doing the right thing by her drinking problem. One night, the in-laws, accompanied by another adult, came out to the house, and a violent quarrel developed. And as a result, the young husband was shot to death. And the testimony indicated that he was shot to death by bullets fired at a very close range, just four or five inches from his face and chest. Then when he fell to the ground, there were more bullets fired just a few inches from his back. Well, the prime suspect in the case was the father-in-law. He was a wealthy restaurateur from the Long Beach area, and he was brought into court. And he had for himself a famous attorney by the name of Joseph Ball, who was a very fine man, and he was a member of the, the Warren Commission, aiding in the inquiry. He was a former head of the State Bar of California. He's handled a lot of remarkable clients, and he's been extremely successful. He was defending this restaurateur. So finally the matter came to court, and the man was charged with murder. Well, the case went through its regular routine, everything going along fine and dandy, and it indi all the indications were that this man was the prime suspect. There was testimony about the shooting and all, and also present in the home that night were some children of the dead man. And they testified. All of a sudden, the proceedings were stopped when the attorney brought forth a sheet of paper, and he said, Your Honor, this sheet of paper was a deposition given to me in my office by the wife of the defendant. And the judge examined the sheet of paper, and in it, the wife, who refused to testify during the trial, the wife said she was present in the home when the shot was fired. She had the gun in her hands. She didn't recall actually aiming at the man, but she did recall pulling the trigger. And then all was blank. But the indication from her deposition to the attorney was that she was the murderer, not the husband. Well, the judge was shocked. And he looked at the attorney and he looked at the other people in the court and he said, I don't believe what the woman is saying in this deposition. I think she is lying because the evidence indicates she couldn't have been there doing this at all. And indeed, her statement cleverly or naively said she was standing 10 feet from the victim at the time she pulled the trigger. Well, we know the evidence of ballistics show that the bullet was entered about five, six inches from the muzzle. So from a distance of 10, foot, 10 feet, the woman could have been lying, or she could have been much closer. The judge said, no, it's just wrong, and he stopped the case. So we now have the defendant, the father-in-law, set free, because the judge said there's no adequate case against this man. That was that. The DA's people then had to resolve what to do next. They did not charge the wife with murder. They fiddled around to this, and they finally decided they would charge her with perjury. Just about three, four weeks ago, out in uh, Culver City, the matter finally was brought before a judge there. And he looked at the deposition, and he said, you can't try this woman for perjury because she did not make any statements under oath on the stand. She had declined to testify to that extent. What she had instead was a simple statement made in her lawyer's office well in advance of the trial. So she was acquitted on the matter of perjury, even though she, what she said was in direct contradiction of the facts in the case. So this is a remarkable thing, and it probably could inspire all kinds of people to work in tandem and figure out how to do away with somebody, and let all the physical evidence point logically to one person, and then bring in your sheet of paper contradicting it, let the first guy go, and you can't be held on a perjury count because you didn't testify. This sort of thing goes on all the time. I read in the paper yesterday that uh, they're going to give some of the defendants out of the college in the valley a week to get themselves an attorney, and then they must be brought to trial or be prepared for court action. Either that or they accept the public defender, and I don't know if you saw that or not. But as I did see it, I thought, my, what a sharp contrast this is to the Saran case, because they're permitting Saran an eternity to develop his case. They granted him one attorney at the beginning. First, the ACLU represented him in arranging for an attorney. He got an attorney of his choice, and then he was permitted to dawdle until Grant Cooper finally was free from his own federal case. And this somehow is wrong. If a judge can say to students from the Valley, you have one week, surely a judge downtown can say in a simple murder case, you have so many weeks 
to get your case ready and hire yourself an attorney, and that's that. The law is bending over backward at the expense of the taxpayers, and that really would be completely wrong. There is much more going on in our area than just the courts. Zoning is a problem. Next Monday, I want to hold a news conference downtown, and I don't know if anybody will come or not, but regularly you invite all of the stations and the newspapers. I want to talk about five things then, what I would do, uh, actually I have 20 subjects that I consider as issues, and uh, they would be what I would do in my first 20 days in office, and I would like to accomplish one thing, a specific thing, change a course of action or get a new direction, of 20 different areas right off the bat in the first month. But there are so many of them, I don't think you can say them all and get them out in adequate time. So I was going to do one week at a time, and next Monday I was going to talk about five things. And I thought that if I were elected the first day, I wanted to do something about zoning. And the second day, I wanted to do something about East Los Angeles and Watts. And the third day, I wanted a specific thing done with regard to the airport commission. The fourth day, the traffic department. And the fifth day, some remarks regarding the Palmdale Airport. Zoning is extremely important. Uh, not only can you become wealthy if you are involved in zoning, you also can become what is termed a social reformer if you're disappointed in zoning. That's a standard term. It is not unique with me. Uh, I, was, I drove through Watts a couple of weeks ago on an errand, and I came to the far side of Watts, where it adjoins, I think, Linwood and some county territory. And you drive through homes, and all of a sudden you're at factories, and that's where Watts ends and the next community begins. And the people who lived in that last block next to the county were faced by factories. And this is outrageous that the city and the county can't get together on their zoning. Uh, the Southern Pacific has some tracks that go right through the center of Watts, if you're familiar with that. And they would like, ultimately, to develop uh, what they call an industrial park. Well, that's just a fancy term for factories and warehouses. Uh, they have now, I think, a single set of tracks, or maybe dual tracks. They can work up some sidings to some warehouses. They have it licked. Naturally, they'd like industrial parks, because their idea of a good railroad is one that's flanked for 500 miles by factories. Well, that's fine. That's fair enough. And I think they should be encouraged in this. They should be aided in the zoning to accomplish this, provided they would provide for a true park, that they would be willing to accept a barrier, that they would be willing to buy land so there could be a park space or apartment space beyond that before the homes began. At present, the tracks are bounded by homes on both sides, and these are the homes of the people of Watts. And this isn't the way to live. We have a more refined example of bad zoning right here, and those of you who live that way, or every time you drive Sunset Boulevard, you can see it. Sunset Boulevard starts at the ocean in elegant fashion and winds through here and Beverly Hills. It might be at its most scrumptious in Beverly Hills. Then it goes through the Sunset Strip, and the strip is simply a strip of unincorporated county territory. And in the strip, the zoning, the basic zoning, is for two-story buildings, and that's all, two stories. Everything else is there as the result of a variance. Variances are evil. But at any rate, there is a variance that permits these tall skyscrapers or high-rise buildings. And as you leave Beverly Hills and enter the Sunset Strip, surprisingly, the boundary line is not a street. It's about 150 feet beyond the last intersection. And on the left-hand side of the last intersection on Sunset Boulevard is a house. It must be worth $160,000, $180,000 on today's market. And in its back, that's the last house. That's the last piece of property in Beverly Hills on that side of the street. Opposite it is Charles Luckman, uh, architect. Right behind that house is a skyscraper that's developed. And I know the skyscraper because ABC has some offices there. Uh, at any, ABC didn't build the building. They merely leased it <laughs> long, long after the controversy was settled. But I was startled that this could happen, that there could be such a lack of concern between the county and the city with regard to zoning, and it's an outrage to permit that to happen. But the county didn't care because their philosophy is you can't really prohibit a man from using his property as he chooses. Well, that's dead wrong. If you buy residential property, you have residences. If you, buy, if you want to have a factory, you go out where it's zoned for factory. You can't expect to buy cheap, undeveloped land and get it rezoned residential and then rezone it again factory. That's unfair and wrong. But that's what happened. And one night on the program, we had Supervisor Dorn on. And uh, it was one of these joint news conference things where there's a bunch of reporters. And finally, it was my turn uh, as host to ask him something. And I was wondering about that building. This is oh, some years ago. And I asked him, Supervisor, how in the world did they let that building go right up in the man's backyard? And Dorn was shocked. He said, my heavens, I haven't driven by that street. I didn't know that was there. I'm dumbfounded, Baxter. And this was on a... <laughs> 
This was on a Friday night. And I said, well, I, I share your shock. And uh, <laughs> he said, Baxter, and he put his hand on my sleeve. He said, Baxter, Monday, I'll look up the records and I'll let you know how that outrage ever was developed. So fine, I thanked him. And Monday, we looked up the records also when we discovered that Supervisor Dorn was among those voting yes for the high rise. <laughs> And that was, a, we had somebody else, we had a, Mayor Yorty used to quarrel with a council at the start of his term. And two years later, he was anxious that a number of council members be replaced by people he favored. And indeed, he was successful in a couple of races. And one of his new people was on this same program, and the reporters were there. And the new councilman was asked by a fellow from the Herald or somebody, uh, well now, councilman, you frequently side with Mayor Yorty, don't you, in matters before the council? And the new council member said, yes, I do. And the question was, why do you do that? Well, because he supported me in my campaign. And fine. And the reporter dropped the matter. Then it got to be my turn, and I asked uh, the councilman, well, how much support did Mary Yorty give to you in your campaign? And the councilman said, well, he gave me $500 as a cash contribution. And I said, well, you mean your vote can be influenced for $500? And he said, well, I certainly would give a favorable consideration to what the mayor is doing. And I said, well, is, is $500 the going rate to buy a vote in council? And he said, well, he couldn't speak for the other members. No, no. The variance, the variance is an evil thing. The conditional use is an evil thing. There, there are ways you can rezone land. You can take it through the council to get it rezoned, and it's subject to the mayor. You can also, after you've exhausted the council, take it up through the planning commission again, and the board of, uh, the zoning administrator, and what they call the board of zoning adjustment, which really is an appeals body. Well, the mayor appoints these various commissions and boards, but I think also he ought to have a veto power over their decisions as well. And I would like to see the charter change, so he is given that. And in this, there's an argument between the so-called Bowron Committee. Bowron Committee examining zoning made its recommendations about four months ago saying that the mayor should not have this veto power. The 1966 grand jury said he should, and I agree with the jurors. The mayor should have every opportunity to uh, exert an influence and involve himself and present himself as a, to the public as a person responsible for a decision. Zoning is bad. Uh, these variances are bad. Uh, out on the Palisades, oh, we have a grading law. And you can remember, if you've lived here for any length of time, when homes used to fall down out on the Palisades and also out in uh, Sherman Oaks and in the Hollywood Hills. And this happened because of improper grading. And uh, they would simply allow too much of a slope or they wouldn't make enough of a soil test. Uh, there were various real reasons they happened and uh, lack of knowledge was one of them. Well, the people who do the developing don't like to see their lots made larger or their slopes made sh uh, less steep because they can get more homes on a steeper, more steeply graded lot. So they fought tooth and nail any idea of a, of a, uh, of a less steep slope. And they lost to a degree. There was a compromise that was reached. And the new slope law adopted two or three years ago is fairly good, except that you can get a variance and the variance means you can negotiate with a city council committee and finally work it through. And the pressure that you use to develop your negotiation is entirely up to you. And I believe that in some cases it could be a campaign contribution, and, and that's a problem. Now, this applies to all of the departments. You wouldn't think parks and recreations would have a variance. Uh, they, they can. Uh, annexation. Some years ago, developers were bringing properties, undeveloped tracts, into the city of Los Angeles because they wanted to. They wanted our aid in streets and lights and police and fire protection and so on. And we were letting them in practically for free. And it was costing more to police and fire protect than we were getting out of it in the way of property taxes. So the council said, all right, let's have an annexation fee. And they argued about it and they finally resolved the fee would be $850 an acre. You want to bring in 100 acres? Well, let's multiply by 850. If it's a large tract of 1,000 to 2,000 acres, this could be a considerable money. Well, a couple of years ago, out on the far side of the valley, above Granada Hills, the Porter Ranch people, the Maco Realty people, which is, I think, a division of the Pennsylvania Railroad, they wanted to bring in Porter Ranch into the city of Los Angeles and develop it. And fine and dandy. They knew what the annexation fee was, but they wanted to get around it. And they said to the city of Los Angeles, look, we have some lovely land. We'll give you a great deal of acreage worth, we say, so many thousands of dollars per acre, in lieu of the annexation fee. And they said, you can make it a park. It'll be just great. It's a delightful view and a grand look at the vista from here. Well, my heavens, the vista, a mountain goat could enjoy it, but that was about all. <laughs> and yet, the Department of Recreation and Parks was given sort of an option on this. 
and they were permitted to, to almost decide. And the general manager, a man named Fredrickson, went out there. I don't know if he tore his pants getting up to the top or not, but he was, he was finally filmed out there in this windswept brow. And he said, oh, what a glorious place. Oh, my, we must have it and let them bring in their land for free. And that happened. And we have it. Now, we have, I don't know how many acres is involved up there. It's not a great deal of land, but it's very inaccessible, rugged terrain. Do we have a park there? No, of course not. We have to organize a bond issue to get enough money to develop that land, to smooth it down. Meanwhile, we have gained nothing from Porter Ranch. The costs are mounting daily on land development. The Porter Ranch now is enjoying fire protection and lights and street maintenance and the whole works, police protection, at our expense, and it hasn't cost them one single nickel, and the Porter Ranch people were spared the ominous task of leveling those terrific cliffs. This is what has happened to us. We don't have one cent to show for it. So these, these ideas of uh, variances or deals, negotiations, I think are dead, dead wrong. Uh, I don't want to burden you with the, all kinds of things and make you think that life is all serious, and uh, it isn't in broadcasting. Frequently, things are ridiculous, too. Uh, <laughs> e even more than they might appear to be. Uh, every, we're pleased that Ike is, uh, is at least uh, convalescing in Washington, D.C. in the hospital. Routinely, when he came out here after leaving the presidency, he would go to Palm Springs, and one of the suburbs down there, and he would spend the winter. He would arrive on the uh, Santa Fe train, and then he would leave in the spring on the Santa Fe. They always gave him a special car, and it was one of the old-fashioned cars with an open platform, so that if the train stopped or whatever, he could go out on the platform and wave and talk with the newsmen. They attached that to the rear of the train. And always, our people would get up early in the morning and get on to meet the train when it came in, the super chief, and then they'd get down to San Bernardino when he was about to leave four months later. And the last time, no, well, not the last time, because the last time he went by air, he was ill. But the time before that, he, w he went by train, and automatically all the news people went down to San Bernardino. There must be ten camera crews that make these trips automatically, one for each station plus the newsreel folks and the networks. And we were down there, and our film showed, uh, taken by our cameraman, showed Ike on the platform, and Mrs. Eisenhower was there, and some other folks, and uh, he was smiling and saying little nothings. And at one point, <laughs> no, 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 I, I didn't mean that. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> at one point, Miss Eisenhower uh, was tapped on the shoulder, and she went back into the car. And then she came out moments later, and she tapped him. And she said, uh, and she, obviously, they were about to go. So he thanked her, and he said his farewells, and he waved and said, we must leave now, and thank you very much, and how much he enjoyed Southern California. And he walked back into the train, into the car, and the door closed, and you, you couldn't see him anymore. Our camera was set back about 40 feet from the, the rear end of the car, and he was using a zoom lens, the cameraman was, and he'd simply pulled back on the zoom, which permitted a wider view. Then for some reason or other, he panned right. Now, the left end of the car was the observation platform. He panned right to the far end of the car. And it wasn't hooked onto anything. The train hadn't come yet. <laughs> Which isn't very funny, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, one of the biggest news events I in Southern California was the one involving the Burtons, before they became the Burtons. This was right after Rome, and she had ducked Eddie Fisher. And they had spent some months down in Puerto Vallarta. And it was announced they were going to go back here to Southern California. And they were not man and wife at that time. And the, one of the most novel experiences in our, our lifetime was watching them come to Southern California. And for this, from Mexico, they rented a uh, two-engine airliner from the Mexican airline, and they were to fly on up to Southern California. They were to land at International Airport around 4.30, 4.45 in the afternoon. And uh, where I worked, we had an early newscast from 4.30 to 5.30. And our deadline, therefore, was about 90 minutes earlier than KNXT or KNBC. And uh, we bro broke our necks to try to compete, because some viewers will just, they're news hounds. And they'll watch one newscast, and then they'll dial over to the next station when it begins. And if you've lacked something they have at 6 o'clock, you're bum. You're no good. So you have to break your neck to try to compete. Well, the plane was due a little after 4.30, and I set up three crews. I sent one crew out to the Lockheed. Am I boring you with all this broadcasting? Uh, at any rate, I sent one crew out to... I sent one crew out to Lockheed Terminal in Burbank, just in case the couple would change their minds en route, since it was a small plane, and they might not want the publicity. Well, that was crazy, but I wasted a crew, but I did it. And the, uh, sent two crews out to International Airport. One crew was to go down on the ground where the plane was expected to land, and they were to stay with the couple all the way to get, to get, to get as much film as they possibly could. 
The other crew was to be our competitive crew, and I had them locate on a balcony in one of the buildings, and uh, they were to use a, a zoom lens. And uh, when the plane landed, finally taxied up, and the doors opened and the couple came out, they would start shooting at that point, not before, because we wanted the minimum of film to handle in our lab. We have a processing lab in the station. And they were to shoot 100 feet of film. That would last us about three minutes, but that would get the couple off the plane and surrounded. But there must have been 300 newsmen for this event, just a pack, a mob. And that was the plan. So we had a runner standing alongside the tripod of the camera. And this runner was to take the magazine of film after 100 feet had been shot, stop the camera, give the magazine to the runner. And we'd rented a helicopter, and it was stationed about 100 yards to the left. <laughs> and it was to be churning from 4.30 on, all set to go. <laughs> And the runner was to climb on board and was to take off. And we have a, a heliport out at the station in uh, Los Feliz. The residents don't know it. They just know there's a strange noise and a lot of clatter. <laughs> uh, and the helicopter was to come. We had cars to light the field and everything. And uh, we were to race the film in to the lab and get it out. It takes about 20 minutes to process a piece of film. We were to get it on the air. We didn't care if it was ragged or had blips or camera stops in it. Just get it on. Show, show that KNXT something. So <laughs> that was the plan. Now, if that failed if for some reason the plane was late and didn't get there by, by the time we reasonably could expect to get the film processed. This crew was to stay at the airport and wrap up, uh, take the camera off the tripod, and then its personnel were to lock on to the luggage. They were to locate how the, where the luggage was handled at the airport for the couple to find out where they st were going to stay because nobody knew. Uh, some people thought they would stay at the Beverly Hills, the Beverly Hilton. Nobody knew. And for some reason that afternoon it seemed vital to know where they were going to stay before anybody else. So that was the plan. Well, the plane was late. It didn't get there, and so all the, the crew did was to lock onto the luggage, and about 20 minutes after the couple arrived, we got the phone call from one crew. We're at the Beverly Wilshire now. The, the luggage is here, but the couple isn't. And we realized we didn't really have a scoop after all because we had no film of the couple. Now, the other crew had been sent out there early at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and they were parked several hundred yards from the main body of newsmen. In fact, they were almost clear off the field compared to the rest of the cars for KNXT, KNBC, and, and the networks, and so on, all the other stations. And the other guys would come up to our people every now and then and laugh at us and say, what's the matter with you? Come on back here. We better get back where the action is. No, our people said, no, we, we, we just want to be here. Well, <laughs> our people, of course, were right because our man had gotten there at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Reporters are in charge of the crews. And our reporter had just sent the crew out, just said, sit in the station wagon. I'll tell you what to do. And he looked up the local representative of the Mexican airline that was leasing the plane. And he spent the afternoon buying drinks for that man. <laughs> so... He knew exactly where the plane was going to taxi, and he was dead right. And the plane came almost up to our, almost touched our station wagon. Our people were there filming. All the other wagons came rushing up, and there was a lot of, com <laughs> a lot of commotion and tumult. And the crowd pressed in, and there were still pictures taken by uh, UPI and others that show Elizabeth getting into her limousine, and uh, sh the door was being opened by a reporter. The sound man was holding the cables up so she could get under. And we really had this event going. And then they were all, there are two ways you can film. You can have uh, film, a camera set up on a tripod, a stationary development, uh, which is awkward but easy for the camera because you get a good steady picture and all you have to do is push a button or maybe zoom a little bit. Uh, or the other is take the camera off the tripod and just attach a shoulder pod and you carry the, shoulder, the, the camera on your shoulder. We do most of our filming on shoulder pod because it makes us more flexible and we can get in and out more rapidly. Uh, a lot of shoulder treatments, but it's worth it. It's, it's money well spent. Uh, at any rate, this was a shoulder pod assignment for that crew down on the ground. So the minute the limousine started up with the, the Burtons in it, our people were off. They were right behind them. They were almost bumper to bumper, tailgating all the way. And they had heard, we had called them on the uh, mobile phone, and we had told them, now you're, you're going to go to the Beverly Wilshire because that's where the luggage is. And uh, we had a code for this because we had the hotels coded so the rest of the competition would know what direction to take off it. Because every, all the competition listens on the mobile phone. They know what the assignments are. And you tell a reporter, stop your car and go to the standard gasoline station, call me on the landline, and uh, so the other stations can't hear the assignment. At any rate, they're going bumper to bumper, and all of a sudden, the limousine of the Burton stopped. And they wheeled into the parking lot of a restaurant, and our people were dumbfounded, but they were prepared. And they <laughs> scooted to a stop, and the gravel flew, and the door opened on the wagon before the couple got out, because the man opened, the chauffeur opened the car for them. And the film showed that our people were at the door of the restaurant before the couple got up there. And on the film, our man, our reporter, is seen opening the door of the restaurant. And he says to Richard Burton, now, if you folks don't like it here, I know every bar in town. <laughs> the first five days, 
that I would like to talk about next Monday will deal with zoning, for one thing. On the first day in office, I think zoning should be handled. I would like to make some changes with regard to zoning. I would like a 30-day suspension, a freeze on all zoning applications then down at City Hall. With one exception, those applications for which hearings already have been posted, because I would not want to inconvenience the public that plan to attend the meeting. I would like to see changes with regard to the submission of applications for zoning conditional uses and variances. I would like to see them submitted once every 90 days or once every 180 days, and I would like to propose a charter change that would allow the mayor to veto these conditional uses and variances so that I could be held personally responsible for the acts of the board or commission. The second day, with regard to East Los Angeles and Watts, I have a great deal of feeling about urban renewal, and I think it's dead wrong the way it's being practiced now, because it's too vast. Uh, a community will get together with the federal government and they'll say, this area is blighted, and they'll point out blocks and blocks and blocks of territory that must be condemned and negotiated and then torn down. And they will say to the residents, oh, this is fine, we're going to just displace you a little bit and we some lovely apartments for you elsewhere. And that's what happens. It takes a considerable amount of time. But it's a brutal experience that wrenches the people away from their homes and their environment, for one thing, and also doesn't allow the, the owners of the land to participate in further action. What I would like to see tried in parts of East Los Angeles and in Pacoima and in Watts is this simply a street-by-street street development. I would like to see some hospitality houses or apartments established near the zone to be redone. One home to be redone at a time, one family to be taken out of that block and put into the hospitality house for 60 to 90 days for as long as it takes to tear down the home and rebuild it and then restore them to their brand new home. Now they will have lost nothing in the meantime. And the people down the rest of the block will know 90 days later it would be their turn, and so on. This could allow for a leisurely processing of the condemnation matters. It will allow the residents there to maintain their home ties. And the folks who were down the block would have hope and faith because they could see it working, and they knew that in due time they too would be affected, moved out to the house, and then restored to the new home. And they would be permitted to work on the projects in their own neighborhoods. I wouldn't do just one block at a time. I would do several blocks, but a house at a time. I think it's vital that a community this size negotiate with the federal government to see if this would be possible. I would like to establish some offices, not formal offices, but uh, visiting hours in Watts, East Los Angeles, and in Pacoima. And I don't mean to spend city's money on, on offices, but I think it's vital you get out there and visit with the people. I'd like one day to be uh, maybe in somebody's home and let it be known in advance where you're going to be. Next day, maybe at the last chair of a barber shop or in a billiard parlor. And don't be shocked, because this is where the people are. And it's where you have to find out about their problems. And I would like to take with me a department manager of the city each time. One of the first managers to go would be the, the chief of police. And I would like him to be with me. And no big guards or no big uniforms or no squad cars around the corner, just he and I. We might take a secretary, but probably not, because we could have pencil and paper ourselves. We could listen, and we could learn, and we could walk, and we could talk. And I would like us also to go to a number of the high schools out in those areas where there might be problems. We'd have to get permission of the Board of Education to go inside, but if we didn't get that, we could stay on the, on the sidewalks outside and talk and learn and be there. And I think that's vital. I think it's vital, too, that all of the other department managers who have dealings with those areas also be present with me, <coughs> like the traffic man, the Board of Public Works, <coughs> all of these, <coughs> the recreation and parks. Uh, <coughs> I would like to encourage <coughs> the development of, of shopping centers. Now, I know you can't have a, a shopping center as lovely as the ones in the valley or down along the coast or out here, but at least perhaps we could induce Bullocks to do something out there, to develop something that would be attractive and new. I know there's an insurance problem, and I would like to work out with Senators Cranston and Murphy and Mr. Finch back in Washington some kind of a provision whereby perhaps the city government or the federal government could work together to guarantee insurers that there would be no problem in the event of a loss of the property. And this would stimulate the development economically of that area. It would get construction going again, new fine construction. In these shopping centers there should be uh, boutiques and specialty shops with uh, wares and goods of such a delightful nature it would attract people from regions other than Watts. East Los Angeles or Pacoima. Interesting stories. Uh, I would like to see the role of the police department redefined to a degree, and that's going to be difficult. I, the changes in uniform, I think, for certain areas could be tried. That's obvious. But beyond that, the police should become known in those sectors as helpful people. 
Maybe this involves hiring additional personnel or police women, I don't know. But one of the problems in these areas is unfairness economically. They have inferior goods, they have higher prices, they have poorer housing at higher rental rates or, or whatever. And I would like a board to develop, a commission, probably in the police department itself, to go out and make these surveys. And then the people would understand that here the police are serving in a helpful role. And I think that would be just one more aspect of blending the two elements in the community. It has to be done, and we must seek ways of making police helpful and respected in those sectors. Uh, I spoke of the, uh, the airport commission. The third day in office, I'd like to take the present airport commission, and I'm not satisfied that they would remain in their positions, but I would like them to remain at least for the third day so I could take them out. <laughs> <coughs> and I want a homeowners group in Playa del Rey to canvas their own organization, to see if there's a home out there large enough to take uh, six or seven of us, or five members of the commission, plus the secretary, who's a man, and then some, some staff members, and I would like to go out. I'd like us to be invited out from one until five, and I would like the airport commission to try to conduct its normal business, a regular session, in one of those homes under the takeoff pattern at Playa del Rey. Just see how they make out. <coughs> at the end of that day, <coughs> I, I want them back in the office, and I want to instruct them that they are to prepare a resolution that absolutely unalterably opposes the idea of commercial jet service out of the Van Nuys Airport. That is that. Uh, the fourth day, I want to deal with the traffic department, and I want the commissioner and the general manager to get together with me, and I want to prepare a series of favored flow roads. And I don't mean to take La Cienega or Wilshire Boulevard or uh, truly commercial streets and turn them into one-way streets, I, and I'm not sure you need one-way streets but streets with a favored flow, where the signals can be set by computer to go 30 or 32 miles an hour, and we advertise these streets. I think of a street is of proper construction and width, and, and goes for 8 miles or 14 miles through a city. For those 8 or 14 miles, you ought to be able to go at 30 or 32 miles an hour, and just a pulse of traffic to go. They do it in many eastern cities. They do it in Baltimore, which is a terrible city, of narrow, winding streets but they even pulse right through uh, on the old US-40. They just have it geared. We should do the same here so that there is a favored flow street, either east or west or north or south, every four or six blocks. And they should be advertised as you go through these intersections. They should be marked with a certain symbol and speed. Also, I would hope to get together with the map people who make the maps that are handed out in gasoline stations to see if we could get these streets indicated by arrows as to the direction of flow, both for the local residents and for persons who might be coming in from out of town to really get traffic to move. There's no reason. We have a fifth of our space in the city is given over to streets. And yet we, we say well, the only place you can move is on a freeway. Now the fifth day, I want to talk about the Palmdale Airport. And uh, it's needed. Uh, international Airport in due time must be closed down and as quickly as possible. Uh, it, it served a purpose, but it now is in the middle of the city. And there's no major city that has an airport in its center. It's not right in the heart of the city, but it is in a fully occupied area. And it's both dangerous, well, it's, it has uh, problems because of the fog, and it, it's just wrong. The noise, the misery inflicted on the people out there is dead wrong. Here we are supporting uh, an airport system for half of Southern California. We're using our income on behalf of developing an Ontario airport. We want to develop a Palmdale airport for all of Southern California off the income made possible by the misery of the people in Playa del Rey. This is wrong. We have the lowest landing rates of any major city in the country. You can land an airplane here, I think, for $37, a 707 jet. You land that plane back in Chicago, I think it's 52 and more than that in New York. You want to land it in London, it costs several hundred dollars. It's terribly wrong for us to be the... We're just... We have people in the city who lose their homes every single year because they can't pay the property taxes on them. Yet we treat the airlines as if they were charity cases. And now maybe your parents work for the airlines, and if they do, uh, I'm not going to apologize because I think it is wrong. We have to do something to make this right. We have to get some income. I, I would like to see the airport and the harbor departments, both, brought back into the city. They're in the city now, but they run their own budgets and spend their own money. I want that under the control of the mayor and the council so we can take 10% of their gross income and put it right back into the general fund where it ought to be. Uh, the Palmdale Airport, we shouldn't be obligated to build that thing. Uh, Los Angeles County should, or a regional committee. But at any rate, so far, the city is committed to do it, and they've set aside 90,000 acres out there. And there's a map that they prepared that shows where this acreage is. It's right alongside or to the right or the east of an existing federal airport, a military airport. Uh, I think that in the last 10 years, a great deal was known among selected circles about where the proposed airport would be. 
And I would like two weeks set aside for a group of clerks in the mayor's office or in the controller's office to go through the records of the assessor to find out the land purchases and sales in the last 10 years for those 90,000 acres. I would like to see what the land was bought for, what names appear again and again, what firms appear again and again, who might have had knowledge about those... Did you know where it was going to go prior to two weeks ago? No, nobody did except certain people. They've got the 90,000 acres so well laid out, they've got it mapped. It's all zoned. It's set to go. So certain people did know this. And I would like to find out what would happen if that airport were to be displaced, moved in another direction, eight miles in any other direction, <laughs> except west. You can't do it west because there's the federal airport. See what would happen if it moved south. And that would take it clear out of the first 90,000 and put it into another 90,000 acres. Just try it and see. Uh, and these are the things that I'm concerned with in the first week. And don't tell anybody because I'm not going to discuss them until Monday. And I thank you very much for your patience and silence. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank Mr. Ward on behalf of the students and invite you all up to the Women's Lounge for a question and answer period. Thank you very much. Washington, D.C., you have to drive to Dulles, or you have to Baltimore. Baltimore. And uh, National Airport in Washington, <coughs> don't take a lot of steps. You can't fly nonstop to the airport. It's next National, which is out by Mount Vernon. The same with the highways. We're the only city with, without this one-way system. Yeah. We have some dots. <laughs> Thank you for your patience downstairs. I appreciate it. <clears throat> what, what is this now? Just people, folks ask questions, is that it? Yeah. All right. Well, I better stand. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions about the school. Yes. First of all, I'd like to know whether you follow, uh, favor local autonomy for the city schools, the high schools, et cetera. And I'd like to know what you think about the situation in the Valley State. All right. One at a time. The local autonomy thing. I think it's worth trying. <coughs> any neighborhood or any city, <coughs> any group of people, really should be permitted to uh, to conduct its own experimentation. Uh, I worked at a television station that was uh, not an independent station. It was owned by a, a network company. But we were permitted to develop our own system. And you, you make it or you fail based on your own endeavor. And I, I think schools should have the same opportunity. Uh, the, the, the parents, the residents there who pay the taxes should be permitted that chance. Uh, it is unfortunate that in certain school districts, the residents can't afford to pay all of the taxes required to support their particular school. But I don't think that they should be uh, uh, made to suffer disadvantage just because of that. The Valley situation, uh, I don't know what, what specific thing you mean with regard to it, just with regard to tumult in general, uh, I think it is one thing to, uh, to make an appeal. I'm a great believer in decency and politeness and kindness. I don't believe in abusive language. I, I, I don't like uh, vulgar speech. I don't like crudeness. And I don't like destruction of property. It offends me as a person entirely apart from the way it offends me as a member of the community or a person who pays taxes. I just think it's wrong. And I think that people in a facility should behave almost as they would at home. And I'm sure that if in your home somebody had come and had taken over control of the kitchen, 
uh, all the damn. <laughs> you'd, you'd be shocked. You'd be outraged. And you would want somebody to do something about it. And if they outnumbered you, you would be powerless to act unless you called on someone, either your neighbors or your friends, or you'd have to get word to the outside to give you some aid. And uh, I think the aid should be, uh, should be properly rendered. But I don't believe that uh, you, you can behave illegally. Now, if you don't like something, you should petition decently and honorably to get it changed. But beyond that, I, I, I cannot go any farther. If I have alienated you, I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. Um, our city, uh, our mayor council relationships are, are, have been in the past six years or so one of uh, a constant uh, fight. Yes. Would uh, you favor any change in the city charter to uh, strengthen the mayor's position, to give him uh, a more autonomous authority? Well, the mayor's role is spelled out. If you read the charter, have you read the charter? No. Well, I haven't either. Maybe I've read two. <laughs> <laughs> I read the page about the mayor because I wanted to. <laughs> and I was thrilled to, to read that uh, the mayor is charged with the supervision of the entire city government. It's his problem. And he used to exercise diligence that all the people in city government behave properly and uh, go ahead and conduct their their prescribed functions in accordance with the law and, uh, as they should the full authority and power is spelled right out there in almost the first paragraph discussing the mayor uh, there are some charter restrictions in which they permit commissions to intervene and that is wrong but the mayor still can operate my heaven's sakes uh, the mayor well just to give you an illustration do you remember a few months ago, uh, the fire chief was back in uh, Knoxville or someplace in Tennessee or Kentucky attending a fire chief's convention? And back there, he remarked to the other fire chiefs that, well, out in Los Angeles, we're going to arm our firemen with shotguns. <laughs> and nobody out here knew anything about this at all. And it came on the wires. And when the fire chief came back, he was pressed for questions, for answers. And, oh, yes, he said, yes, it's true. It's all decided long ago. And uh, come to find out, it was decided at a meeting of the fire commission back in April of last year. Well, nobody knew anything about this. And as soon as the fire chief came back, the mayor also came back, I think, the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> From, I don't know. And uh, he said, oh, this is an outrage. And it's another illustration of how the city charter permits these commissions to do things. We've got to strengthen the charter and give the mayor more power. Well, the mayor illustrated his power that very afternoon after the cameraman left because he called in the commissioners and he said, change that ruling and that's that. And the next day, they changed it. Johnny Grant is the head of the fire commission, and he held a news conference, and he said, yes, we changed it. Uh, the mayor wanted it changed. He has enormous power. All he has to do is fire them if he doesn't like them. And uh, he, gave, he did fire one person outright, that was Mr. Letterer, in the Parks Commission. And this demonstrates that if you have somebody who disagrees with you, get rid of him. Get him out. And you can get them out. You can have, when you take office, a whole new group of commissions. Or you can replace them one at a time. You can do it as you choose. You can control the commission. And I said earlier downstairs that I thought it was an outrage that a commission would uh, make a decision in early spring and the mayor wouldn't find out about it until late fall. The way you correct this, and the way I would want to do it, I would, you have uh, 55 basic people in the mayor's staff now. I think that's too many. But I would, uh, certain key people I would set aside, and they would be the ones who would have liaison with the departments and the commissions, uh, the Department of Airports, the commissioners for the airport department. They would attend all of the commission meetings for their particular department to which they were assigned. And they would know the agendas in advance. I want these agendas published. I want them publicized so that everybody would know. And I don't want secret matters being brought up swiftly, quietly, before uh, some commission, something having to do with the harbor or recreational parks. I want it all spelled out in advance. And when it's done, I want the minutes summarized and released to the news people so everybody knows what's going on. And my own people there would be present uh, engaging in conversation, giving advice, and if there were any hint that the fire commission was going to arm somebody, my man would be instructed to call me because I'm right downstairs and say, Baxter, you better get up here. They're going to put shotguns in the hands of the firemen. And I'd go right up there and I'd stop it right then. Either that or I'd fire them outright because you can't have certain things happening in your name. You're responsible. But the commission idea is wrong. Bureaus, boards, and commissions are bad elements in government no matter where they are. Washington, here, you have to have people who are elected responsible to the people. They say that politics is a dirty game. It isn't at all. It's simply a matter of responsibility to the public, to the people who pay you, who put you in there. And you have to give them a chance to pull you out of office. Just like that, there shouldn't be boards and bureaus that overlap one person's term into another. That's wrong. 
uh, if uh, Mary or if, if I were to do something wrong or Governor Reagan or whoever, throw him out and the whole shebang goes out. We pay these people $10 a meeting, these commissioners, and they meet maybe once or twice a month or a special meeting. So for, for $20 a month, they're running city government. And that's crazy. They have no responsibility. Nobody voted them in. Nobody knows who uh, half of these are. They don't know who one-tenth of the commissioners are. If these commissioners make decisions regarding their homes, about the airport, regarding their taxes, that's what should be changed. The commission thing is bad. Yes? Uh, in regards to the commissioners, what would you do in regards to conflict of interest to change the laws on the Well, somebody asked me that the other day at KNXT, and I was dumbfounded because I was totally unprepared for it. I never thought about it. Uh, there are some laws now regarding conflict of interest, and I guess uh, it would be mandatory that you examine the laws and try to tighten them up because they are loose in many areas. And I would like all of the people in government to be obliged to follow a certain code so that if they were, if they were found to be doing wrong, they could be properly penalized. That's the main purpose of a law is the penalty. I, I don't think that that particular law is going to discourage them. I think your problem there is to hire people of sufficient moral tone that they aren't going to do these things. That's the problem. Uh, no law on earth is going to frighten some fellow if he wants to make a deal with the Harvard Department. Uh, yes? Mr. Moore, I noticed that you said uh, you weren't going to accept any outside contributions. Yes. You weren't going to accept the North. How then would you be able to get your message uh, <laughs> modestly. <laughs> uh, I'm holding these news conferences, and as I said, I don't know if anybody will come or not. I'm just going to do them, and if they do, great. Uh, if they don't, it's my tough luck. And I've a number of talks arranged. I have a young lady that I hired, and she's in the office, and she's lining up these talks. I hope to get four or five a day, just go place, 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 and talk. Maybe two or three hundred people at a time if I can. And that's the campaign. That's all there is to it. And I will say these things that I believe in, and I will welcome questions, and I want to talk. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I've, I've lost, but I can't worry about it. Uh, yes, yes, any, any, yes. Uh, you were beginning your talk with the critical of some recent court decisions. Yes. Uh, and you said you felt that somehow City Hall could affect things. Yes. Unlike the commissioners, you don't have the power to fire judges. Uh, what could you really do about it? Glad you asked that question, because I forgot the whole point downstairs. Um, I, for years, I've been terribly distressed by narcotics and their sales at schools, at high schools. I think this is terribly wrong. Uh, peddlers who engage in this, I think, should just be crucified. It's an outrage. Uh, here they are, despoiling lives and doing it all for, for their own profit. Uh, some years ago, in Los Angeles County, back in the late 50s, 59 or 60, <coughs> there was a group of judges, in Los Angeles Superior Court judges, eight or nine of them, who dealt, who had, when they had narcotics offenders before them, dealt strangely with these offenders. Now, the law in California then was that <coughs> if a man were a narcotics peddler and he were convicted the first time of peddling, the minimum penalty would be, I think, one year. That was the minimum in state prison. Then, if he were convicted a second time, the minimum was 10 years. It was something like that. There was a drastic increase for his second conviction. It was what the law said. Well, these judges would get before, and one of these judges has gone on to a higher court. He's on the appellate court right now. Uh, these judges would get these peddlers before them, and they would have, as defendants, men with records of peddling in narcotics. But they would strike or ignore the prior convictions and treat these offenders as first offenders and give them the minimum of one year in prison. They did this again and again and again. And more, I, I worked at Channel 13 at the time, and I did a survey on it, and I was dumbfounded by the cases. And the grand jury did it. And finally, in 61 or 2, the law was changed just to take care of these judges. It ordered them. It said, you cannot strike or ignore a prior conviction. Just as the judge in Culver City permitted the DA to drop one of the manslaughter counts against the fellow, the woman who killed the two motorcyclists. Just one of the bodies was missing, as far as the judge is concerned. That's wrong. You can't do that. Now the narcotics thing. I would like to say, <coughs> we support the police department. If you live in Los Angeles City, you pay for the whole works of the police department. We have a fortune. It's the biggest single department in the city. It costs us a lot of money. So we should be extremely interested in how they spend this money. And a lot of their time is in certain departments, bureaus, is spent in narcotics and narcotics offenders. They arrest the peddlers again and again. They bring them into the courts, and the courts frequently will treat these offenders far differently than I think is right. And I would like a study made 
that showed, that, that might demonstrate if there were any pattern, if there were certain judges or certain leniencies granted in certain areas uh, for people who peddle narcotics at school grounds. And I would, if there is a pattern, I would like to publicize it as mayor. I have no authority at all, no jurisdiction, but I think the public is entitled to know what's happening to the money they spend on the police department. We also support a third or a fourth of the court costs. They're entitled to know it from that direction too. But publicity could be a valuable thing, and that is the only service that I could render. But believe me, I intend to ask the police commission to develop those records. Yes? Uh, two questions. First of all, what would you do about the uh, tax situation in the city, and then secondly, about the smog situation? The tax situation, you can't do anything about, <clears throat> because you, you can't <coughs> promise anybody you're going to have less taxes. I would like to cut out immediately all non-city costs from the budget, and they're, they amount to millions and millions of dollars. The harbor and airport departments have a quarter million dollars each about, or maybe more, for advertising and promotion and entertainment, and that's an outrage. Eastern Airlines, or, uh, they know where their places are. They know where the hangar is. You don't have to, <laughs> you don't have to, you know, to do that. Uh, same with the harbor. Uh, we have $100,000 budgeted for a trade fair to Japan, or trade mission to Japan. It's outrageous. They want to use our harbor and hop to it. We have a whopping set of rail tracks in there. We have good facilities. We have bond issues that uh, restore these things. We're converting to, uh, to containerization out of the harbor. We don't have to publicize this around the world. The word, word spreads instantly. In, in, within the regular budget, uh, we have uh, such things as $100,000, uh, $75,000 for the Philharmonic Orchestra, $35,000 for the League of California Cities. Well, that's outrageous. Uh, there are all kinds of California cities. Let's give $200 if we have to help support the secretary or something. <laughs> really? Uh, $4,000 for the conference of mayors. Well, that's something that the mayor goes to each month, each year. He goes each month. What in the world does it take $4,000 to get him a hotel room and go to some <laughs> dinner in the Hotel Sherman in Chicago? Uh, I would like to see that again, $200. And that's all. And if the rest of the mayors don't like it, that's too bad. I think we have more to offer them than they have to offer us. And if I wanted to, uh, to get in touch with Mayor Lindsay, I could write him, or I could phone him, three dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and if that didn't satisfy him, the next time he could call me. Yes, sir. Are you suggesting graft and misuse of public funds in our public government? <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. I think this is a great, this is a great waste, a great waste. Oh, well, other people should have been. No, I, I don't want to criticize. Uh, uh, I, I said that I was not going to criticize the other candidates uh, at all. I'm going to hold two news conferences to discuss two of the candidates, and that's the last I'll speak of. That's all. I want to ask you. Oh, yes, yes. The question was about narcotics. Yes. Do you feel that marijuana, narco marijuana, should be treated as other narcotics? Uh, probably not. Probably not. I, I think there's a great deal of study yet to be gone into in that. Mm -hmm. uh, but until uh, the studies are conclusive, it probably should be yes. Yes. Well, how nice of you to say I'd that. Like to, I'd, like to, I'd, I'd like to know uh, why do you think you're the person that can do it? I mean, uh, there's constant friction between mayor and council. Why do you think that you, you can do these changes and, and in such a short period of time? I, I can't. No, I, I say that I simply want to propose these things the first week. I want to bring those commissioners in from traffic on Wednesday. Thursday, I want something else. Just to bring them in and get these things started. Oh, no, it's going to take a long time uh, to get these things done. But I, you have to get them started. Somebody has to try and so far, nobody's tried. I think anybody can try. I think uh, Mary Yorty could, or uh, Mr. Reese, or Mr. Bell. Anybody can do it. <coughs> it's, it's just that uh, it, it, these are my plans, and I submit them, and uh, nobody likes them. That's too bad. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, young lady. Yes. Yes. Uh, <coughs> We attempted on the television station to encourage uh, uh, concern for this, and I think the Marianne Barata case, you remember the Marianne Barata case? Uh, helped to dramatically demonstrate uh, the need, but it, it died out. <coughs> Interest dies out so rapidly, and we failed to capitalize on it. Last uh, May, I asked the governor's office if he would consider visiting with us down here, and he did not, but he did ask Spencer Williams to come down. And we talked for about two hours in his office in the state building, and I uh, had some other folks there. Uh, and I tried to convince him that people are dying of this disease weekly. I think it's four or five persons a week. And they had uh, one of the doctors from the state health department there. 
And they said, well, they'd do a survey. And I asked, well, how long will the survey take? And they said, oh, maybe eight weeks. So I said, well, look how many people are going to die in eight weeks, and you just multiply. But this didn't concern anybody. And some weeks later, they did send out a survey, and Mr. Williams wrote a very nice letter. But his letter did not acknowledge that the deaths were occurring, frequency that all reports indicate they are. Nothing is happening. Uh, I think that in addition to performing your basic duties in any office, you also, also should stand for something else. And if I could uh, again generate some attention to that subject, I would try to do so. Yes. In your speech, you gave several examples of campaign funds being used for personal advantages. No, I did not. Well, in the case where you said what was happening, Mayor Norton uh, contributed to a council to uh, yes. a attorney at the uh, Court of the Mayor. Yes. Is the reason you're not accepting campaign funds because you see a new conversation? Yeah, oh, yes, yes. Uh, now, Mr. Bradley said at the start that he had, I think, $300,000 in his campaign then, and he was expecting another 200000 I think that Mr. Bell already probably spent up his own money from 75 to 100 and a quarter in, this, in these first 10 days of the campaign. And goodness knows how that will go later. Mr. Yorty has, uh, I think, about a half million, they say, just already, and presumably could get more. Now, maybe uh, 80 or 90 percent of that is good money from folks who honestly believe that uh, uh, Mr. Bradley or Mr. Bell or Mr. Yorty are excellent people and the men they want in government. But somewhere in there intermingled is bad money. There's mischievous money. And it's from developers and expediters and folks of that nature who want something done. And uh, a man will say, a candidate will say, well, I don't know where the money is coming from. And he might honestly mean that. It might be true. But in due time, in a year or so, something is going to come up. Uh, I know in the case of Mr. Bradley, uh, a couple of years ago, he got $2,000 from the uh, from Brian Gibson, if you recall. The Brian Gibson case later came up. Well, Bradley said he didn't know anything about it, but indeed his campaign finance chairman got the money. And I would imagine that in due time, that finance chairman would be reminded, would have been reminded by Brian Gibson, look, I contributed $2,000 to the councilman's campaign for council. Uh, let's talk. I don't know that this would happen, but it's, it's a likelihood. Yes? Mayor, would you find doing much <laughs> no. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I was thinking the other day, uh, and I, I might be stricken with something immediately, but I, I have not, uh, since I've been in Los Angeles, I haven't missed a day of work, uh, with the exception of uh, was it death in my family, and out of state. Uh, I, I was sent uh, to the East four times by my company, and in 15 years, that's those are the only absences. Uh, I don't approve of being absent from your desk. I don't think you accomplish anything in Memphis. West Germany or Paris, or <laughs> <laughs> I think you could accomplish a great deal in, uh, in touring the city, and I would like to, to enter homes and uh, establishments and learn a great deal that way. But you have to be here. <coughs> yes. Yes. A few years back, um, <coughs> the convention center thing started with yes. Mary Yorty proposing that they buy the William Randolph Hearst building, and the Coliseum Commission had put up land in Exposition Park, and they said they would pay for the building of it, and a certain amount of their take would be distributed into the city fund. And Mayor Yorty said, no, that's not proper, and that we'll buy the William Randolph Hearst building for such a price to the citizenry, and they would have to pay for the building. Well, there was a commission, well, not a, a private commission, of uh, landowners <coughs> on Santa Barbara Avenue, and they proposed that they do take the Exposition Park, but Yorty opposed this and said, no, I'll drop the William Randolph Hearst building. And then he went to Exposition Park, and finally he got land on Pico and Figueroa, yes. and he's building that now. Now, this is coming out of the taxpayer's pocket. Yes. So why is it, I mean, would you have sided with what Yorty proposed, or would you have taken the Coliseum Commission? No, I would not have permitted it in the first place. We're talking about $38.5 million as it now stands. When I first came here, about the second year, they were trying to develop a sports arena. And they, they scuttled one set of plans at great expense, several hundred thousand dollars, and they developed another set of plans for the sports arena. And the way they sold the bonds to develop the sports arena was it was going to be a convention center for all of Los Angeles. And indeed, some conventions were held there, including the Democratic Convention in 1960. And it was a convention center. Now, that thing is dark. Three or four nights of the week, it's just plain dark. They aren't, I don't know how in the world they paid the bonds. Uh, if there were money in convention centers, believe me, There'd be convention centers all over at private expense. There is one, Jack Kent Cook. And uh, a few months ago, I asked what the figures were on Cook's Forum. And they're dark two or three nights of the week. They, they're able to make it. They're, they're, they're paying it off. 
But the thing we're proposing is $38.5 million just in basic cost. You add the interest to that, it goes on for another 20 or 30 years, depending on the bonds. And you have a thing that has to be, that place has to be open every night of the week, grossing a minimum of $10,000 a night to pay for the, the bonds and the interest. And you aren't going to make it. These other places are dark. Who's going to go to your convention center down in that location? Uh, convention centers are, are a luxury, and uh, they should not be entered into by a, a city that already has one, or that has people who are, are going broke on their property taxes. You can't do it. Yes. I have two questions for you. First of all, um, do, you, would you, do you have any stand on, on uh, civic gun control legislation? And secondly, um, do you regard this mayoral attempt as the beginning of the career or just as a mayoral attempt? Oh, I, oh, uh, for the first thing, uh, gun control. I have a, a gun and it's registered and it didn't hurt me at all. Uh, I wasn't damaged. I favor gun control. I don't know if gun control will work, but I, I believe in trying things. You've got to try. So I favor trying. In, in answer to your second question, uh, I could take the worst shellacking in the history of politics and I might, I've counted 37 votes so far. <laughs> <laughs> you might stop there and uh, I don't know. No, heavens. Uh, the city thing seems like fun. Uh, forgive me for using that term, but it seems interesting. It seems like you get in there and do something and work. It is very interesting. If I, if I survive the race, I'd be thrilled. Yes. In all the years we've watched you, and we watch you every day, we've never been able but to guess. But I haven't guess. been there. <laughs> every day that you're there, we've watched you. I've never been able to guess what your political affiliations are. Now, I know that the mayor's a nonpartisan office, but would you care to disclose which party or if you're in uh, Well, I re-registered as a nonpartisan for this race. Prior to that, I was <laughs> Could I ask one more question? Yes. Is there a relationship between the mayor's office and the Los Angeles City School System? And if so, do you believe that the system should be revised so that seniority becomes less important than a person's... Uh, there is no relationship, and I would be out of line commenting on it. I'd be, I'm going to be criticized or not, but I don't sense enjoying that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the Board of Public Works, you know, goes around and tearing up streets and putting the sewers Yes. Uh, a particular yeah. example is the Devonshire at the far end of the valley. <laughs> Uh, at the current receipt, they tear it up about once a month. <laughs> <laughs> and then, next week, the traffic department comes out to put new streetlights in because the port, Board of uh, Public Works has torn up their streetlights. The treadle system. Yes. And uh, is there any way you can do something about yes. this? Yes, yes. Uh, you can uh, require a posting and you can uh, develop a rule in city government and you can notify the utilities and all developers that uh, such and such a street can be opened and it's going to be opened on such and such a date applications will be received for this and that. You can hold up a develop <coughs> development. There's no reason on earth that uh, Galaxy Homes or somebody uh, has to proceed on its own schedule. They, I, I think they should go on the taxpayer's schedule. And they must program, uh, they program their efforts uh, to depend on when the bulldozers are available and so on. They also should program them on the basis of when the streets are available. And you can, you can require bonds be posted. But I think that if, uh, if an outfit of utility uh, or a company is permitted to rip up a street they should post a, a repair bond because when they put the earth back in and it's tamped down, uh, the thing never is right. It isn't right for months and you rip it out again and they rely on cars and foot traffic <laughs> to, to press down the earth. That's wrong. Uh, they should be required to have a roller there every other day and that's just part of the cost of ripping up the street. And I'd like to see that done. Uh, let me go on somewhere else. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, do you uh, envision any sort of rapid transit and any sort of On the... Uh, Southern California Rapid Transit District, we now have two of 11 representatives. This is wrong, and it's not in ratio to our population at all. I would like to see the legislature uh, change this so that we could be fairly represented. For one thing, I'd like Los Angeles actually to run that board. They can't if, if they're in the minority. I don't see any reason why the supervisor should have five members or the other city should have uh, the balance of the 11. Just wrong. But at any rate, since we don't have control of that board, I still believe in experimentation. Uh, there's nothing illegal in our trying to do something on our own. And I would, I, I think that things work if you make them economically feasible. I think you have to have people making money off something before a thing will really work. And I would like us to, uh, a year ago we set aside, a, I think, one and a quarter million dollars to give to the Rapid Transit District to aid them in their campaign to get publicity for the bond issue that, that failed. But we have that kind of money available. So just figure a million or a million and a quarter. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a million or a million and a quarter. <laughs> uh, if we were to try on an experimental basis leasing some rail tracks 
I would like to see this done. I would like to see us negotiate with the Southern Pacific, for example, to try two lines out of the San Fernando Valley as a starter. These are lines that are presently in existence, they're in good repair, and they go from point to point. They originate in Northridge, where they converge out there, and one line is the main line that comes out of the hill and goes on toward, uh, it, it parallels the uh, uh, Golden State Freeway. The other line is a lighter rail, but it's still decent rail. It comes on down through Canoga Park to Woodland Hills, Tarzana, uh, Reseda, Encino, and then veers on back toward Burbank and joins up with the main line. I would like to see us offer the Southern Pacific Railroad, say, a thousand dollars a day. I don't know if that's too much or too little. But give them a profit to let us practice on their rails. I would like to see us negotiate with some eastern city that had a surplus or some old bud cars to release, or with the bud manufacturing company itself to let us have a six-month lease on brand new cars, because a lot of times they'll make equipment to be ultimately consigned to Burlington or Reading or something, and uh, maybe the date is uh, October and you could get it in, in April to try it. And uh, you could also work the bugs out of the equipment. Get some rail cars out here, at least 20 of them if necessary, and set up a schedule for their leasing. And some cars would have 60 seats, some would have 45 or 44. And maybe the 45 car seat cars would, uh, would have coffee or, or hostesses on them, I don't know. Just experiment. And then arrange for some track space alongside the tracks for parking. And lease or buy, if you have to, uh, land adequate for the parking of four or five hundred cars at maybe every mile interval at, at these points, or two miles, whatever it would be. And arrange with the Board of Public Works to have designed some little canopies for, for weather protection. Not all weather, and nothing with the uh, utilities in them, just, just something to give you a little shade while you wait for the car to come. And uh, then let the cars start on the schedule. Now, we wouldn't be participating with any other city. So when we got to the Burbank line, from there we could just go on down to Union Station and see if people would ride it, if they'd try it. What it costs, now we're, say, $1,000 a day for the, uh, the track rights, maybe uh, $2,000 a day for the cars. And you still haven't spent, as, as, what's that, $900,000 or a million dollars there. St and the operators will cost you. You're still spending almost the same as you did just to give a subsidy to the Rapid Transit District to try their campaign for advertising purposes. And you could try this for six months or a year, maybe, and just see how it worked. And it might work to beat the band. I would like to see reactivated the existing lines of the old Pacific Electric system, which have been absorbed by the other railroads. If you look at the Southern Pacific map, or any map of rails, my, they have a handsome network here in our county, much greater than that proposed by the Rapid Transit District. The only thing they really lack is a line from downtown to the airport. There is one, but it's not a good line. I think it needs some realignment. But if you were to try to reactivate these things, one route at a time, maybe the, after you get the valley thing going, the next one should be from downtown to the airport. And spend some money, let the Board of Public Works allocate some grade crossing money, and get things going. Now the railroads might not want to participate, but, but I think they would, because they have relationships with the city that they would like to keep going. They say they don't want to, but they need uh, lines to the harbor, they need grade crossings, and certain, they need all kinds of things. You could work out something, yes. No, no. Uh, my agreement with them uh, was made in June. In, uh, I, I'd read an article in Newsweek magazine in June, uh, middle of the week. It was in the Periscope section, and it said that Frank Mankiewicz was considering running for mayor of Los Angeles. And uh, I read this, and I, I thought, damn, he's right. He's right. He's going to try to run. I would like to try to run. And it just got me all fired up. And I think I read that on a Wednesday, because I remember vaguely a two-day delay. And I mentioned at home that I was going to give notice. I was going to try to run for mayor. And uh, on Friday of that week, I, I asked a girl in the office to look up uh, what the filing dates were for mayor. I, I thought it was about six weeks that you could file during that period. And I was surprised when she came back with a little note that said, uh, it's January 2nd through the 6th, and that was all. And I took the note, and I went up to my boss's office general manager, and I told him I'd like to be free by January 6th, what I wanted to do. And he said, the company's owned by a New York firm, and he said, would you take it up with New York? And in a few weeks it was worked out that I would be free. Uh, my last day would be the 3rd of January, so I'd be free by the 6th. And uh, there is no relationship with them whatsoever. It's a complete quit. And uh, uh, if I, you can't expect them to, uh, to sustain you. They have a great, there's a great deal of money riding on these news periods because stations make their income 
not from the network programs they have, but from the, uh, because that money goes back to the network. Uh, the comp each of the companies, NBC, CBS, is this sort of stuff for you? No. Sure. Each of the companies is split up into various divisions. I'll get back to you after a while. Each of the companies is split up into various divisions, and they have, uh, CBS has a records division, so does ABC. They have a television network division. <coughs> they have the owned stations division. Stations will, uh, a company can own five television stations and seven radio stations. They all do. Uh, this company makes the bulk of its money from its owned stations. And they're required to put back so much money to New York just to keep the company going. All the networks have that same system. The networks don't make their big money from their national programs like the Beverly Hillbillies and so on. <laughs> CBS makes the most of their money from KNXT, the station in New York, and the other three stations that they own. Outright, that's where they make the money. And the, the biggest income to these stations comes during their local time. Now, yes, excuse uh, me. Yes. Some of the people in the back can't hear. Can't you hear in the back? No. Oh, I'm so sorry. This might make a lot. All right. Uh, the, a program like the Beverly Hillbillies will contribute uh, maybe two, three hundred dollars to this station for each of its announcements. But during the period from 4.30 until 7.30 at night, which is local time, the stations can make a thousand or fifteen hundred or two thousand dollars for each announcement. So see the difference. So the more local time they have, the better. An announcement I imagine in the big news will cost about two thousand dollars or maybe twenty-two, twenty-four hundred dollars. But if they were on network time at that time, they'd only make four hundred dollars for themselves. So they like their local time and uh, it means a great deal. Well, news on CBS occupies uh, locally 60 minutes, NBC 60 minutes, and the same at our place during this local time. So a great deal of money is at stake I in any of these local news periods. So you can't expect a station to say, all right, we'll hold your job open for you. <laughs> and, uh, no, you can't do that. There had to be time for them to cast about to get somebody, hire him, and he had to give notice where he worked if that was involved. And you had to have a, an advertising campaign and publicity, and that it cost several hundred thousand dollars. Also, if you if you had a deal to go back, you would feel uh, restrained because you wouldn't be able to campaign. Uh, I believe that the airlines, for example, have a good deal out at International Airport. I think their landing fees are too low. Well, I couldn't go around uh, criticizing airlines if the spot announcements are carried uh, during the news where I work for United Airlines or any of the others. It would be wrong of me to do so if I had a deal to go back to them and accept their money again. Can't do that, so it's free. Yes? There's several things you can do. Now, the control for smog is under the county and the state, state for motor vehicles and the county for fixed locations. Uh, in this city, a few weeks ago, we saw a demonstration by the Southern Counties Gas Company of a new type of fuel. And they said that you can put gas in your car, and it has a higher octane rating, and it'll give you just as good performance, won't hurt your engine, and they'd like to try that. I don't know if they're right or wrong, but I believe in trying things, and therefore I would like the gas company to stage a series of demonstrations involving accidents. Uh, because I'm not sure that uh, a gasoline tank would explode in a car would explode as readily or be as susceptible to explosion as fumes. They, they would have to, if they had a gas, they'd have to give it a much more aroma than they do now so you could detect it, should there be a, an escaping uh, gas. I'd like to see how some rear-end collisions work, what happens in the event of some rear-end collisions. And if they were no less safe than a gasoline-powered car, I would invite the gas companies, the two of them here, to, at their expense, take 100 of our cars or 50 of our city-owned fleet, not the police cars, because police officers might feel they need the, the gun or something, or the gunning ability of a of a regular engine, uh, let them convert these cars at their expense to the, the installation of the, the other gas tank in the trunk. Uh, building and Safety, for example, doesn't have anything in the trunk. They just have some clipboards. Well, we could give them 100 cars or 50 and try it. Let the companies put in their own tanks. See what happens. And if it works fine and dandy, might expand the fleet, the whole fleet, try to get the county to do the same and other cities here to do the same. But beyond that, I believe in money. And I think that... Uh, well, even, no, really, truly, uh, I think if you make a thing economically valuable, rewarding, it'll work. And if in buying our fleets of cars, we bought them on the basis of not the chrome or the performance or the width or the price, but instead on the basis of effectiveness of the smog emission device, we might have something. And uh, th there was a conspiracy that was developed by a federal grand jury, and the three motor companies were uh, disclosed to have been engaged in a conspiracy to just keep the lid on. But if they discovered individually there was money to be made in Los Angeles County on the basis of how effective their devices were, 
maybe millions of dollars in the balance, because these fleets are huge. If we could encourage the county, and in fact, all of Southern California to do this, and the state fleets that are based down here, that's a hell of a lot of money. It's an enormous amount of cars. And they couldn't afford to ignore that kind of income. And the word would get out. I would be delighted to publicize as an official that so-and-so company has the best smog device. And it's entirely likely that the citizens might give up a Buick or a Lincoln or whatever it is that doesn't do that if the Imperial were better or the Plymouth. It just might work. You have to try it. Also, it's terribly wrong that the city's own uh, power plants out on the coast are contributing to the smog through the variants. They are permitted to burn crude oil because there's not enough gas. I'd like immediately to appeal to Washington for funds to build a pipeline from the gas source in Texas out here to the coast, and one that could supply the cars as well, and let it be repaid by the, the two gas companies down here, or maybe over a 30-year period. To get enough gas out here to run those plants uh, all winter long, so there's no problem. Uh, those are three things I think you could start with right off the bat. One more. We have a lot of contaminants in the air, all kinds of them, and some you can control, some you can't. I've never been convinced that lead is good for us in the air. We have a great deal of lead. Uh, this is true. We have a great deal of lead in the air from leaded gasoline. <coughs> it just goes up there, and ultimately, I imagine, it settles. Maybe it settles on our head or in our lives. I don't know where it settles, but it's there, and it probably should not be there. Now, I'd like a quick survey made of how many particles there are of lead in the air. We can stop the lead. Back east, there was the American Oil Company had as its best grade of gasoline, Amico White. And it had no lead additive at all. It had the highest octane rating of any gasoline going in the East. It was their premium grade gasoline. They quit refining it since then. They now use ethyl corporation additives too. Out here it's all ethyl. And they say, well, it's, it takes more time in the refining. It costs more money. So it does. We, uh, we have to clear the air. And I would like to see if the police powers of the city would permit us to forbid the sale of leaded gasolines. You couldn't do it all at once. But you could say that by such and such a date, uh, these pumps that are licensed for sale here, we license them, uh, must sell white gasoline or proper octane. We could specify the octane so nobody's engine would be hurt and no dealer would lose business. That would give the refineries maybe uh, 180 days or two years, whatever it took. Everything takes time, but you have to start and you have to have the will to say it and the nerve to say it and try it. Yes. 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 What do you think of the recent trend in which many actors and television personalities have entered the <laughs> it's deplorable because it doesn't leave room for one more. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know how your time is. Uh, yes, you. Yeah, um, within our <coughs> city boundaries. Um, please let me please let me know when it's time for you to go because I'm always embarrassed when people just walk out. So do say it's time now. Okay. We yes. Still have a, a, a few places where you know it isn't covered with pavement or covered with houses or something else, like the Santa Monica Mountains. So yes. There. Uh, and they, they may have only um, uh, fire roads running through them now or uh, two-lane paved roads or something like that. Then when they talk about building a four-lane you know, scenic highway through yes. it, they're talking about building a highway that will, in reality, destroy much of, the, uh, much of what is pretty, you know, yeah. the, the solitude and the serenity, et cetera. Um, with, does the city have uh, any power to uh, control uh, how much of our uh, still natural land is uh, destroyed? Well, I, th I think you're under a it isn't our natural land. It's owned by people. Most of it is owned by people. And to make it our natural land, you have to buy it. Griffith Park is a gift. That lovely land atop Porter Ridge is a, is a gift. <laughs> uh, <coughs> land is only, unless it's a state park or a regional park, it's owned by people. And the thing wrong with that road out there, ultimately the land's going to go. You might just as well accept that, unless the, the jurisdictions get together and buy some of it and carve out 8,000 acres and say this will be natural. And they probably should do that. But the rest of the land's going to go. And the thing wrong with that road was that the land developers were asking the taxpayers to build the road, which in reality is just an access road to their developments. They want a lovely four-lane road out there for us to pay for so it'll open up their, their works. That's what was wrong with that. Uh, some years ago, there was a, an annexation to the city of formerly county territory, and the developer was so slick, he, he stayed in the county because the county had road, at that time the city didn't have road money from the gas tax. He got county, a half million dollars worth of county gas tax money to develop his streets, help develop them, 
And then when that money was accepted, and he assured everybody he's going to stay in the county, the minute that was done, the streets were paved, he then made application to the city for annexation so they could get the police and lights and, and so on. So you got to watch him. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. You no, know, in the back. Wait a minute. Yes. Yes. Well, you can't pay them less, and you can't expect a, a person to live uh, in any decency, with any dignity or honor, uh, on, on less than they are making now. I wouldn't want to pay a public official less than those council members are getting. I see nothing wrong with the five-day week. They do complain about it. They say there are committee hearings and so on. They should be attending and going out to their district. Well, the meetings are fine because the, the five-day meetings only last until 12 noon anyway. A lot of them don't get there till 9.30 or 10, so we're talking about two, maybe two and a half hours a day of consistent performance. Uh, I have no objection to that, and uh, so we are the only city in the country that does that. We're the only city in the country that has an airport in the middle of town. <laughs> it doesn't... <laughs> no, that doesn't harm them. Yes. Yes, I already have. Uh, I asked... Uh, that we, we tour as a panel, and I got no response from Mr. Wilkinson. Mr. Yorty said no, he didn't have time, and he was so busy running the city. <laughs> <laughs> truly, truly, he did. He did. Don't watch the city. Uh, Mr. Bradley said yes, and uh, Mr. Steinbeck, I think it is, uh, said yes, and Mr. Schulner said yes. But because I wasn't able, and oh, and Mr. Bell's office said that he was back in Washington running the federal government, <laughs> and he would be unavailable. So, and he had to be ready to fly back at a moment's notice. You can come out here and make a commercial <laughs> and then go. So, uh, I wasn't able to put it together. I would welcome it, but I, it isn't a reality. Yes? Did you give us your general I think I did earlier. I think I did earlier at the outset. Uh, I'm sorry you missed that part. Yeah, uh, yeah anyone knew? Yes. I, oh, oh. It seems to me that uh, municipal courts, I've noticed, are usually open like from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. Yes. It seems to me that uh, most people... You're dead right. Yes, you're right. You're right. Yeah. And maybe maybe we could uh, start a, some sort of an, uh, an example by encouraging the council to hold night meetings from 7 to 9, maybe three nights a week or two More or one. That, don't yes. you feel symptomatic of, of the uh, pull away from the government from the idea of being for the people? They're, they're no longer for the people. They're there for their own glorification and their own welfare. And you find that, I noticed in your news program, you brought that out with many of the members of the city council, who you uh, mentioned were looking in opposite directions and talking to their mother when the people were coming up to uh, ask questions. <laughs> I never said they were talking to their mother. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> they were doing this on our time when people were, were confronting them with, with problems. People were pleading before these, I know. you know. Yes, it, I think it's tragic when a busload of people from way out in the Canoga Park will hire a bus and get themselves all organized at 8 o'clock in the morning to get on for a council meeting, and there's no quorum. And that's <laughs> happened. That happens again and again. Or they'll, an item will be canceled from the agenda of a commission or a bureau. That'll happen. Uh, all, all you can do is try to set an example. That's all. You, you can't force people to do it. Uh, I don't know how to do it. Really, uh, forgive me, I don't. Anyone else? Uh, yes. Oh, one more. All right, one more. I was wondering what you think of the recreation department. Uh, there's not enough park land in the city as it is, and most of it is public land. Yes. And there's a lot of park land that's not being used. And there are some cases where the parks that are there, beautiful green areas, suddenly turn into Little League fields that the people in the neighborhood didn't even want, but the recreation department said they wanted a Little League field there. What do you think could be done about things like this and putting in concessions where there's no need to have them and things like that? Well, some concessions, I think, are enjoyed. The golf concessions are enjoyed. What concessions? Uh, well, I mean, sometimes you have, like, like a, the swimming pools you have there, uh, you have to buy certain things before you can get in. Like, you have to buy a towel before you can get in. You have to buy a towel before you can get in. You have to buy a towel before you can get in. You have to buy a towel before you can get in. You have to buy a towel before you can get in. And a suit? No, no, no. I mean, you have to, in essence, buy a towel when you can just buy a towel. You can just easily bring your own, and usually do. I see. Things like that. Well, that's... I, I, to be honest, I don't know about that. Forgive me. I hear I'm shooting my mouth off, and, <laughs> and I, I never thought about that at all. Uh, forgive me. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly look into that. And <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we don't want to lint uh, where it should not be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.